right. Greetings, greetings, family. Welcome again to another episode of the Grand Rising Collective Podcast for the new year, 2020, well, 2022. <laughs> All right, we are in the future. We are living in it. All right, hopefully you have had a great year thus far. Uh, hopefully that you and your family are safe and well during this time. And we are definitely pleased to be back for this new year, myself and my co-host, colleague, partner in podcast, Kadi Bentley. Uh, what do you have to say, Kadi? What do you have to say to the people? Uh, well, th thank you. Uh, and again, in my effort in being brief, happy new year to everyone. I hope you brought it in safe and, uh, and healthy. Uh, you know, to emphasize the, to stay hydrated, even though Omicron it doesn't have the same death toll um, as the initial virus did, it's still important, you know, and then we have the vaccines coming out now and um, a lot of apprehension regarding vaccines. And I deal with teens whose parents say not to take the vaccine because they're afraid to turn to a zombie and, you know, it's going to mess with their birth and all that. Um, you know, I just wanted to, 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 to stress you know, just to use caution uh, to use your wisdom, you know, uh, eat healthy, uh, and then try, you know, you, no, no day is promised to you. So you want to make sure that you, you know, you give every day your best. And if the Omicron and the pandemic didn't teach you that, uh, I don't know to an extent what else will. So we're sitting here, we're sharing here. And I just want to say, uh, in sitting here and sharing here, bring in this 22, 2022, uh, with a new motivation to make your dreams come true and keep persistent no matter what. Uh, no matter what challenges face you, because in the long run, uh, that's the only thing you're not going to want to regret when you don't have that next day. At least you want to say, at least I tried, I gave it my all, and I can uh, pass the baton, you know, uh, without that without that frustration or disappointment. That's all I want to say, Kyle, in regards to this 2022, and I hope that was brief. Indeed. No, it was, my brother, and it was right on time, you know, because, again, these are interesting times we're in. Uh, but we definitely want to introduce our guests that we have for you all today. The, the world-renowned, <laughs> the esteemed Dr. Herbert Harris, you know, author, uh, uh, previous attorney, mentor, entrepreneur, right? Dr. Harris uh, is well known for uh, many of his books that he's written, but one particular book in mind, The 12 Laws of Universal Success, all right? Welcome, Dr. Harris. Thank you for- My for pleasure. Time. Thank you so much for having me, and I salute the work that you're doing. It is just completely rewarding to see young men, young brothers, doing what you're doing, bringing light to the world, bringing knowledge to the world, helping transform the next generation. You, you have overcome a disconnect between prior generations and the future generations. So I take my hat off to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I take my hat off to you as well. Indeed, indeed. You know, you're you're one of the people who helped set those those trails for us to follow follow down, and uh, you set the tone for us to be able to come in and do something like a Grand Rise Collective podcast. So, you know, much respect to you. You know, absolutely, absolutely, indeed. inspirational, very, very. And and the book, which we'll get into later, family. You know, you'll see why. You know, you'll definitely see why. Uh, Dr. Harris is definitely one of those people who uh, who's definitely uh, creating uh, a mindset of a success and achievement, especially in the black brown communities. All right. So Dr. Harris, let's get into it. Uh, could you could you inform our family, our, our listeners, like, you know, who you are, you know, your educational background, where you're coming from. Um, and, and also, as we talked about previously, uh, off camera, just like the era you came up in, you know, your generation. Yes, Kyle, thank you. I, uh, I came uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was actually came to New York in 1960. See, I, I don't worry about age, but I was born in 1944. Okay. And uh, I came to New York. I grew up in the South, in North Carolina, in the segregated South. Mm -hmm. I never actually had a meaningful conversation with a white person until I'd come to New York. I got a scholarship to come to Columbia University uh, at the age of 16. At that time, they were looking for uh, talented black students throughout the South. 
and I had come to their attention. I, I came to summer school in New York, the Rhodes Prep School down on 54th Street. My mother and my aunt were school teachers and they felt that the education I was getting in the South was not, they wanted me to get a bigger picture. And so I came to the Rhodes Prep School in the summer. Uh, I guess that would be the summer of 1958, 1959. Max Roach's daughter, Max Roach, the jazz drummer, his daughter was going there then. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I came to the attention of Columbia. I got a scholarship to come. And uh, I actually, uh, in those days, black students didn't take the college boards in the South. Hmm. So. In 1959, I guess I was like the first black student in my town to take the college boards. We had to go to a segregated school. That's the only time I ever set foot on that campus. Okay. And uh, I was scared to go to the bathroom. So, wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, anytime the police got to be there for you to take a test, it's not a good day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, <not>. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's hard to focus. But anyway, right. I, came to <laughs> I, I came to Columbia in 1960, and uh, I graduated from Columbia. My, my major was actually physics. Mm. Yeah. And where in those days, we had, uh, there were five black students out of about 725. Uh, most of them had come from either Bronx High School of Science, Erasmus, or Stuyvesant. So when I hit Columbia, I thought I was so overplaced. I mean, it, that those first that first year was a killer, you know. And it really turned me against college. You know, sometimes people want to rush kids into college, mm -hmm. but being sixteen mm -hmm. and being really overmatched. Mm -hmm. I mean, that first year, I had a particular problem because if I did not succeed, I had skipped the twelfth grade, so I didn't have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. I thought my school was going to give me a diploma mm -hmm. because I'd gotten accepted at, co at college and gone on to Columbia. I had assumed they were going to give me a diploma, mm -hmm. but they never did. So uh, that was stress. And that, that whole period there at Columbia was one of racial tension, mm -hmm. you know, and only two of us graduated out of the five. And uh, wow. it was not, it was, it was not a real pleasant thing. I never felt a part of the school, you know. Mm -hmm. It was about 35 years before I ever went back to the campus. I only went back mm -hmm. when they had, a, uh, they had an event for, uh, for uh, President Obama, well, before he became president, but he and uh, uh, the fellow who used to be uh, Attorney General, uh, they were both class mm -hmm. of 63. And they invited me back because most of the younger blacks at that time didn't really didn't really understand the blacks who'd gone on before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there were only two of us left, so it wasn't hard to pick us out. That's for sure. <laughs> Pepper in the sea of salt. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, that evolved. I then became an attorney, mm -hmm. and I practiced law in New York, and I was in the music business. I was a songwriter. I had a couple of groups, you know, like a one hit wonder, one hit song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I played the Apollo Theater mm -hmm. and evolved and in the practice of law, got into more trial work, worked on some of the uh, big cases in the Harlem era. My, my, my uncle was an attorney and he was the attorney that when the uh, police went into the mosque on 116th Street, someone was shot my uncle represented the mosque and whatnot so that was a part of that a part of the formation and dissolution of freedom national bank which was probably dissolved before you all came along <laughs> but and i attended the march on washington in 63. wow you know and always always wanted to be a part of history okay. and just been apart from the march on washington dr king's general uh, President uh, Kennedy's funeral, to always be at those points in history to see it for yourself and to feel it for yourself. Um, well, yeah. Dr. Harris. So that's about my background, you know, yes. so that kind of went <laughs> was a, a, an attorney and uh, living in Harlem for so many years. 
that's rich yes rich that's rich um all right so you mind if i interject cal with a question please my brother go proceed so it was interesting to hear you say dr harris how uh you didn't want to go back to uh the campus because of the experience that you had after all those years yeah um but yet all these years you have still been able to maintain a level of excellence uh, I deal in, in di- I deal directly with inner city youth, and they are dealing with a lot of challenges. Um, in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club, in fact, recent, you know, currently, you know, they got a lot of anger issues that they're struggling with. Um, so it's, it's, it's a challenge for me to try and get them to channel that anger and energy into something more constructive. Mm. My question to you is. Our challenge, not just as youth, but as people during this pandemic, how have you been able to maintain your level of excellence through this pandemic that we're going through and the challenges that we're facing on personal and professional levels? How have, what do you use? What method do you use? Or how have you been able to maintain your standard of excellence through all this opposition that we face, especially us as a culture? Yes, yes. You know, it all started in high school and elementary school. Growing up in the segregated South, the black teachers had a care and concern for you that the teachers now may not have. Mm -hmm. The black teachers felt that they had, they told you you had to be better than they expect you to be. Mm -hmm. You had to be, you had to be excellent just to be considered average in the outside world. Right, twice as good. Twice as good to get paid half as much. And so with that mindset of always striving to be the very best, no matter what. So no matter the fact that you had secondhand books, you still had to be the best. It ain't the, it ain't the color of the page or who's written in it before you got it. It's the content that makes the difference. Mm-hmm. And so having that sense of excellence, of always doing a good job, of always completing it, no excuses. That's the teacher thought there, no excuses. You know, segregation could give you excuses, but that was the era that black people owned their own businesses. You had to take care of yourself because there was nobody coming to save you. Mm -hmm. And so when we progress that on up to this moment throughout my life, it's always been about completion. One of my old partners, Tiamo Raouf, we used to have a company in New York that we were in the Hotel Teresa and was called Willpower Willpower. Will power, build power. Yeah. yeah, we actually had a, 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 a transformational, motivational company, and we even had a newspaper, <laughs> Will Power, Bill Power. And the theme was always complete yourself. Mm. That or whatever the task to be very much goal oriented, so that you always complete the task. Right. Now you may not complete it in exactly the way you set out to. But always, if somebody sends you out to bring home the bacon, if you bring home collards, you still came home with some food. <laughs> now, you didn't come home with an excuse. Right. And so that was a mindset of no excuses. So when the pandemic came, for me, it was really um, business as usual because I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm retired. I, I run a couple of businesses. I'm in my studio now. And so I worked here anyway. And so the, the pandemic took me off the road from speaking engagements. My last speaking engagement was Tuskegee University in uh, February of 2020. Mm, okay. And I haven't been on the road to any more speaking engagements since then, not in live. Okay. And mm-hmm. so when I when the pandemic hit, it gave me a chance to focus on things that I wanted to do. You know, you got to have a do list. Yep. You got to have mm-hmm. a vision. You know, the Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Yep. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that the pandemic did so many times, people get so involved with survival mm-hmm. that they never think about thrival. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when the pandemic says you can't go to work, you got to stay home now. You start thinking, you're like, man, well, what am I going to do while I'm home? <laughs> What am I going to do with this time? The pandemic gave us a gift, the gift of time. Mm. And you see, 
time is God's gift to us. What we do with that time is our gift to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the pandemic made a lot of people look around and say, man, you know, is this all there is? What am I working for? I'm going to work every day, working real hard to come home and go back to work every day and work real hard. Mm. So folks got a chance to stay home and many times people go look in the mirror. And when they look in the mirror, they see the most important person in the world. Mm -hmm. Would you, uh, I don't want to cut you off, Dr. Ab, but I wanted to ask you, do you uh, and Cal, do you mind if I interject this real quick in this train of thought? Uh, what are your having said that, Dr. Harris? What are your thoughts on in the news or what's broadcast? Where a lot of people are not even returning back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that whole resignation. Yes. Well, you know, once you find out who you really are, it's like a revelation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you. I'm trading my time for your dollars, mm -hmm. and now I've been giving you something much more valuable than I thought it was before because I was so hooked on the elixir of a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And now with the pandemic now, I can see, I can live without that paycheck. A lot of things I thought were important are not that important anymore. You know, let me seek my happiness. You know, in the beginning you seek money, you seek wealth, but when you get smarter, you seek happiness. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of rich, unhappy people, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, sir. So, and so you seek happiness and when you when you get this chance to be awake and the beautiful thing was to get paid while you were awake that was i think the the kicker mm -hmm. if they had not come through with the supplement with the with the with the the stipend the money to keep people flowing mm -hmm. and they knew they had to come through because if you have think about this if you don't have a way to feed your family mm -hmm. pay your rent take care of yourself mm -hmm. and no way to go out and work mm -hmm. it's chaos it would have been like tear this thing down <laughs> and so having money coming in now and time to reflect on who you are mm -hmm. now says you know what never again wow yeah for your measly dollars and so people are looking now for a greater representation of who they are they see their potential they see the godness in them now mm -hmm. Before the job defines you, the man only pays you just enough to keep you from quitting. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, and Dr. Harris, I like what you said uh, a few uh, just a minute ago. The elixir, yes. Uh, you know, because we we were all under that elixir, and some people say the spell. We were all under yeah. that spell, yeah. you know. And like I said, working now, you know, I'm an educator. You know, Kai is a you know entrepreneur educator, and we love what we do. Right. Yeah. We love what we do. But me and Kylie talk about this a lot. It's like that that one occupation, as much as we love it and we know that we're making a difference, it does not totally define us. You know, because because we existed before that. Yes. You know? yes. And, and and the like you said, the pandemic, if people looked at it in a certain way, it was a gift because it did give us time to think. But what would you say to the person? And I'm going to go. It's, it's kind of like a two part question. What would you say to the person who had the time or had the revelation of living in their purpose mm -hmm. but also what would you say to the person who felt like they couldn't deal with themselves who felt like it was too much time yeah yeah well that's one of the you might say the yin and yang everything for every light there's a darkness for every positive there's a negative mm -hmm. and there's some people that when you give them their time back they have no vision you see the mm -hmm. bible is very clear where there is no vision, the people perish. So if you give a person their time back and they have nothing that they want to do, nothing they want to be. Many people have been so crushed down by the negativity of their education, their family. You know, we couldn't choose our family. And so a lot of times our family has imparted the first three words you learn as a child, a no, stop, and don't. <laughs> Then you learn, shut up, okay? <laughs> and then depending on how the parents implement those words, some people, some kids get totally crushed. Mm -hmm. They're living in an environment of criticism, of negativity, of hate, of pain, of hunger. And so now you give them time, they don't know anything else. Their only vision was to eat. 
vision didn't go beyond that. I, I, I knew a, a person once, uh, uh, an attorney, and I had gone to visit her. And when I went to visit, I, I, I asked for some water. She said, get it out the fridge. I go to the refrigerator, it was a big refrigerator, and it was full of food. I mean, you couldn't even put a bottle of water in there. And so I said, oh, wow. I said, I didn't know you had a family. She said, I don't have a family. I live here by myself. Hmm. I really? I said, your refrigerator is so full. And it caused a whole paradigm shift. She said, look, when I grew up, I was always hungry. Hmm. She said, all I could think about during the day was eating. Hmm. My stomach made noises you should never hear. And she mm. said, I made up my mind then that I will never have an empty refrigerator. She said, I used to go and look in the refrigerator like something magic was going to appear when you're hungry. You keep like, opening <laughs> it or something. Right. And so that constraint of her youth, even though now she was a successful attorney, it still defined her. Mm -hmm. And so there's some people that are, are locked in like that, and they, they just don't see any other way. And that's why your work is so important. Because many times somebody's got to show the way. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, you mentioned some some key points there that I like. So it's funny that you said, and I want to I want to make sure I'm clear on this. So we're raised in an environment where where you learn <laughs> the first word you learn is no stop, don't, and then eventually shut up. Is that environment typically? Would you say that that environment uh, is an ex a representation of the black environment or the black culture, the black experience, or all cultures? It's all cultures, but it is, it is, I call it enhanced in the black community. Mm. Okay. You see, I come from the era where your mother taught you to survive. Mm. Your mother actually told you, don't look a white man in the face. Mm -hmm. Don't look in the eyes. She told a young boy, don't make a white man mad. Mm. In other words, she gave ideas to you to protect you. Gotcha. Because mm -hmm. she understood it. And so white parents, all parents tell their kids just to protect them from themselves. No, don't put your hand on the stove. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Stop, don't drink the alcohol, you know? Right. <laughs> don't walk on the glass <laughs> but, in, but in the black community it's enhanced because those acts could bring about death you look at Emmett Till mm -hmm. yeah. an innocent kid doing a very harmless act mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he paid with his life so in the black community these constraints these, these, these ideas are very much for protection Got you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because what's so is uh, I don't know if I don't know the right word to use to describe it. Um, but it could be what's so disappointing, what's so astounding, or what have you. Is we just had what George Floyd, right? Who you know, and then you know, who went through what he went through. And you have parents saying when you go out now and you're dealing with police officers, the same thing. Uh -huh. You know, you have to act this way to save your life to survive. Yeah. Um, the other thing you mentioned earlier was where you said. Uh, a lot of people, when they had this time to themselves in response to Kyle's question, they didn't know what to do with themselves, yes. um, right? And, and and it's because they were raised in an environment where it was no stop and uh, things like that. But you also said they were crushed down by education. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Because I'm dealing with a lot of teens now. Uh, the dynamic is sort of changing where their, their mindset is they don't feel they need an education because of social media because of youtube yeah. because of all these other ways of generating income can you elaborate more on what you meant by crush down on edu uh crush down by education with the understanding that we both know education is valuable we need yeah. it but it has to be structured right it has to be strategized use the education to benefit you and not let the education uh drown you in debt and tuition and all that other can you elaborate more on what you meant? yeah well thank you so much that is a great question brother Bentley. Mm -hmm. The in the let's just say the 50s and the 60s, we were taught that education was the way out. Ba baseball players didn't make millions of dollars. Okay, many of the baseball football players had jobs off season working yep. in 
beards. Yep, those summer jobs. I, I read about those. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they didn't make enough money. They, I mean, the thing about I think Jackie Robinson was making like forty thousand dollars a year, and that was like big stuff. I mean, that was after he made it. <laughs> okay. And so we we had a different paradigm of, you know, playing ball was okay. It brought you notoriety, but you did not get wealthy from it. Mm -hmm. So education was taught to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. Something happened when integration took place. Mm -hmm. First, in 1954, the Supreme Court, they had to sue in Brown versus the Board of Education to dismantle segregated schools. Mm -hmm. Many, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina right now, Wilmington 10, one of the great cases. They just, the lady who was stimulated that was one of my classmates. Wow. She just died. She was the, she was the uh, publisher of the black newspaper, the Wilmington Journal. And for years she fought to have them cleared. I just saw Ben Shavers uh, at a, an event about a month ago. Okay. The same people that fought segregation, that, that fought integration in the courts. So in Wilmington, Dr. Eaton, the black doctors got together and sued, and they finally integrated the schools in 1968. So what's that 14 years later? That happened all around the country. So now, the same people that fought integration now are still in control of the school system. So now we send our kids into that environment. Mm -hmm. The same people that fought it now are in charge of our kids. Mm -hmm. wow. And so when you look in the South, the, the paradigm was the black schools were so inferior that we closed them down, bust the black kids to the white school. That was a symbolic story. Right. And so many of the black kids coming into that environment, I mean, I have st stories to tell you how the teacher wouldn't even look at you when you're sitting in the class. A kid got sent suspended because he got in the way of a girl who was trying to stab him with a pencil. Wow. <laughs> Reckless getting in the way of a white girl trying to stab somebody. Okay. <laughs> this, this is one of the tales that we, that we were told about that. But anyway, so when you have a school system teaching you, teaching your kids who don't love them, mm -hmm. I mean, how are you going to perpetuate a separation system and love them? Exactly. So that whole system, you look at Malcolm X, when they talk, when he was telling his teacher he wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Remember the movie? And she says, oh, no, your kind can't be lawyers. You need to learn how to do something with your hands. Yes. You know, be a mechanic or something. Be a carpenter. The story something. of Malcolm's mother and how they put her in an institution for 25 years just to take her land. Mm -hmm. down. So when you have, and that's really the paradigm of the system. I mean, I'm not saying all white teachers are bad and whatnot, but there is a paradigm. The people who run the system, the power structure, that does not necessarily love black kids. Yes, mm. yes, let's call it what it is. That's it. Yes. And so you look at the suspension rates. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, a kid's marginal. He does something like kids do. When a white kid does something bad, they say it's kids being kids. Mm -hmm. when a black mm -hmm. kid does something bad, they say, oh, we need to teach him a lesson. Mm -hmm. So he's marginal, you send him home for 10 days. What do you expect? You think he's going to go home and study to keep up? <laughs> so he can come back and say, look, I did my homework. No, mm -hmm. he's going to be mad because you sent him home and he knows it wasn't just. Mm -hmm. He knows it wasn't right. And so in this, if this is the major paradigm. So many of our kids are educated in this. And it's not just the South. I mean, the, the North has its own issues. You know, it's you have blatant racism. You have underground racism, but it's still racism. So. You have kids raised in this system where expectations are different. Mm -hmm. You know, as educators, you've seen that that experiment where they had a they picked a set of kids randomly, and they told the kids, "You're smart. You're going to go to college. You're going to excel." Mm -hmm. And then they they took what they said the best teachers in the school system to mm -hmm. teach these kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, at the end of the day, okay, 
the kids who were programmed to say they were they they did excel they did great and so the teachers were patting themselves on the back and they said listen we didn't tell you this but the teachers were selected randomly also <laughs> and so everybody's put in here that what was the difference the difference was the paradigm the thought right and so if we had a, a system where black kids are expected to do great right expected to do well mm -hmm. we're permitted to be children how you look makes all the difference your name we, we used to do training yep. with the board of education and we found that when the kids came to school the first day of school, when Tyshawn, when the teacher said, T, 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 Cho, and the kids said, my name is Tyshawn, mm -hmm. that teacher's never going to call his name again. Right. Okay? So right. now, how is he going to connect? Right. <laughs> See, right. These little things. Yeah. And so that's what I mean, the system, the education system. I don't know who's running it. Right. Mm -hmm. But whoever it is, think about it. You used to be, when I was a kid, you could go to school and you could come out, they had trades in the school. Right. So you could come out as a tailor, as a carpenter, as an electrician, as a brick mason, and be good enough to get a job. Right. Now, you know, they took all the trades out of school and they wonder why the kids don't want to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that all of this crushes down mm -hmm. on children. And they respond in different. If you come from your parents and my parents who were able to negotiate and move us in a certain kind of way, so we didn't get caught up in the system, we didn't get, you know, arrested before you get to the seventh grade. By the time you get to the twelfth grade, you got three or four felonies. Yep. Okay. Yep. We got you in the system. Hey, you got you in the system. But so we were blessed to be able that our parents helped negotiate us, and we were very clear about where we, somebody got it the way. Mm -hmm. Without that, then we could be a statistic ourselves. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Thank Real you. quick, Cal. Let me yeah. interject. Um, uh, knowing that that's set up for for young people, particularly inner city youth, the education system in and of itself. I think this this question is uh, very pivotal at this point. What led you into starting and running your own business, become in, in terms of being uh, an attorney as well? Right. Because I think. Uh, and Barack Obama said this as well when he was in office. He said the old way or the old paradigm of success or surviving is outdated. The industrial age is gone. Yeah. You got to now learn a trade. You got to now learn to start your own business. And I think that's a one of many solutions that these young people can have to buck the education system that we know it today. So the question is, what led you to starting and running your own business and be, uh, in relation to becoming an attorney? Yeah. Sorry, Kyle, I just no, no, that was the question. That was the question I was going to go to. Yeah. <laughs> well, it goes back to Brother Ben. It goes back to once again the the model. Coming up in the segregated South, we saw black people in business. Business was not looked at as something way over there, but we saw black plumbers, you're able to see black it. cab drivers, black yeah. undertakers. White people didn't want to do anything for you. They were going to come fix your house, <laughs> bury your behind. Okay. So we saw businesses. Sidney Poitier was saying how, him, although he was born in Miami, growing up in, in, in the island with Cat Island, everybody around him was black who was doing business, the policemen. The cat. And so it gave a different model. My grandmother was a, she didn't go to college. But she was a, an entrepreneur, you know, she owned houses. She had rooming houses in those days. Mm -hmm. And she had, in those days you provided food and everything because black people couldn't stay in hotels. So she had rooming houses. She literally had little hotels, had four or five of them around town. So we had a model of entrepreneurship. That was all part of the deal. Your hustle was built into your, your DNA. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know? You, you didn't expect anything, you know, like you look at the job, you like, the mindset was like, hey, you better learn how to hustle. You better do something to create money for yourself because that job could go any day. See, that was a paradigm that we had. Mm. When, when, when the young men, one of the Greensboro Four started to sit in was a classmate of mine, Jojo McNeil, General McNeil, okay? Wow. Jojo, when they tried to sit in here in Wilmington a year before, the white people went straight to their parents and said, look at here, you tell them boys stay home. 
Okay. And that was the end of the sit in. <laughs> when they went to Greensboro away from home, then they could sit in and their parents wouldn't lose their job. So in the black community, your job was only as guaranteed as the white man you worked for. Mm. So you had to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So that's in the DNA. I became an entrepreneur because I, that was, I saw my uncle. He was a lawyer, but he owned building. He owned the shoe shop. He was, he, you know, he always felt that you had to generate money. He worked as a waiter down in Atlantic City when he was in college. That was how stuff worked in those days. So the entrepreneurship was there. When we look at today, we have to reinstill that in our young people. Yes. You know, that you can't, you know, we were teaching a class and they were talking to young people. We, we had a program called Youth Bill. We were teaching young people to go into the construction industry. And when I was asking them in our training, I said, well, what do you want to be? Where do you see yourself? By? I want to be an NBA player. I want to play basketball. I want to play mm -hmm. football. And the why do you want? Because they make plenty of money. I think Shaq had just signed a, a contract for five years for a hundred million. They knew all about it. I said, well, uh, I pull up an article. What's the brother used to be head of American Express? Uh, Ken, uh, Ken Chenault. Ken Chenault. Yeah. I said, now, have you ever heard of Ken Chenault? Nope. Well, he just got a raise from 20 million to 40 million a year. Hmm. They didn't know. They were like amazed. He makes more than Shaq. Yeah, he makes more than Shaq. Okay. So we have to really begin to express, to educate the young people what entrepreneurship is about, where it can lead. Every All of the major players, the people who make lots of money, most of them are entrepreneurs. And that just simply means that you take it upon yourself to employ yourself. See, that's the other paradigm. The only difference between an employee and 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 being an entrepreneur is who writes the check. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the work is the same. <laughs> the job's got to get done. If you're on a restaurant, you're, you're working behind the counter. When you're an entrepreneur, you got to work behind the counter, clean up the place, buy the food, cook the food, but then you write the check. But the work still has to get done. So we have to really redefine. It's really not really. It is really to define entrepreneurship for our young people. Mm -hmm. this, until you are in a position where you control the exchange of your time for money, you're either going to be a victim or a victor. If somebody else is determining how much you're worth on a job, then you need to look at some other alternatives if you want to be worth more than they say you're worth. If you're happy with that, there are a lot of people that are happy with it. And you can't knock it. If you have, if that brings you joy and, and it works for you, but there's a whole nother world out there. There's only two words standing between you and financial challenges, and it is you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> ooh, he dropping gems, y'all. You dropping gems today. That's the infamous word of Trump, right there. Oh, yeah, man. right. He's like, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, wow, Doctor Hell. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, so much history and so much depth in what you're saying. Because I mean, you lived it. You 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 had that experience over over your lifetime. Um, to it's it's like a two part question again. How how does one begin to start the process of becoming an entrepreneur, finding what what they can put their energies into to create wealth or to create income but also you know you know we are all entrepreneurs in this room right now and we we have the we have the um the fortitude and the resilience to keep going how can someone a young person or an adult person be, begin to get through that because a lot of time is fear you know and again I, I'll, I'll speak for myself i've definitely had a lot of fear in reference to starting my own businesses or ideas but I was able to push through personally because, like you said, I saw the examples in my family. I saw the examples in my community. So I knew it could work. Uh, but how does one who doesn't have that push through those failures and fears? Because it's tough. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent question. Excellent. Kyle, 
you know, imitation is powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I love the apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. That if you want to be an entrepreneur, I would recommend that you go and work for somebody who is an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and watch them. Sometimes you have, my uncle was a very hard man. He was an entrepreneur and a lawyer, but he had a mouth that was, he came from that era where it's almost like, I'm gonna educate you by tearing you down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know how the old folks used to yep. say, you ain't nothing, you ain't gonna be nothing unless you yep. get off your butt and do something. Right. right. <laughs> and so I learned from him that sometimes you have to ignore what a person says so that you can watch their feet watch how they move and so i think as a as a young person if you just say hey i want to you got to have a dream first mm -hmm. and so you really need to if you don't have a vision a dream then you're not going to have the motivation to go to it the dream is what draws you to it mm -hmm. so if we can if we can work with our young people say well what would your life be like if, if money was no option what would your life be like if you could create all the money you needed? You're not seven feet tall. You like me. I had no athletic ability. Too bad they didn't have like money for spelling bees. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what can you? You know what? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? And really expose them to more businessmen. Let them see the businessmen's lifestyle. Because we, you know, when you communicate with young people, we have to communicate with them in a language they can understand. Mm -hmm. You know, we can come and talk about, you know, some of the high sounding, you know, like well, once you're in on your own business and your profit margin, you're in control of it. They go like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But we say, hey, when you're on your own business, then you can own a car like this. Okay. When you're on your own business, you can have a house like this. You can go these places. Okay. And you won't go to jail for doing it. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. And so when they begin to see it, yeah, I live in Wellington and we've been blessed. I have the house my mother built and I own that. And I bought the house next door when I came back to take care of my aunt. So I live next door in my studio. This is where I work here. I, it's a, everybody has to find their rhythm. Right. right. When I lived in New York, my mantra was I always want to walk to work. Okay. That was my mantra. Now, in the beginning, as young people, you have to really impart to them the knowledge that everything has a season. Yes. Right. That you can't start off being the boss. Right. You know, one of the challenges with many young people, they work 90 days, they want to raise. <laughs> they want to tell me how to run my business. <laughs> so to, how to set aside your ego and say, look, just watch my feet. Mm -hmm. Just be dedicated, hang in there. So, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. now I was going to say one of the things that you mentioned that one of the things I try and share with them that was taught to me growing up was um, you have to do what you have to do before you can do what you want to do. Yes. You know what I mean? You got to pay the dues before, you know, you, you can't start off in the corner office, but yeah, out there. Like they say you got to pay the cost to be the boss. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Lay it down. laughs> but if we could get more of our young people to come out and see that, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that really, I remember as a young man going over and I go to New York, going out to St. Albans, Queens. Mm -hmm. And it was great to see where James Brown lived, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where some of the other entertainers lived, where famous people lived. Yeah. I mean, that made an impression. I can still see his house. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and so to to help our young people to not so much to relate to them in ways they can understand. Mm -hmm. so I was going to tell you one day I had. Uh, I was down in the next block of the, another building that I used to own. And I saw a group of young people up in front of my house. So uh, I'm thinking for a minute. Somebody said, man, there's a bunch of young guys out there in front of your house. You need to check it out. Mm -hmm. So I came up the street. And so the young fellow, he had dreadlocks and everything. So uh, he said, you own this house. I mean, 
And he said, what do you have to do to own a house like this? So clearly he'd been talking to the neighbors. I said, well, I recommend that you stay in school, get a good education, get a good job, save your money. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> save your money, invest, and you can own a house like this. Mm -hmm. He looked at me like I had said something that he never heard. <laughs> I said, that's, it. that's all you got to do. So he said, what, would I, what do you think I should do? He told me he was a student at one of the colleges here in North Carolina. I was surprised because yeah. he didn't look the part. Yeah, yep. He like a thug. Yep, yeah, yep. So he said, well, what do you think I should do? I said, do you really want me to tell you? He said, yeah, yes, sir. I said, the first thing I'd do, if I were you, would be to cut my hair and buy myself a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and a pair of shoes. They didn't even have shoes in their closet, a whole bunch of sneakers. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So then, then he looked at me and I told him, I said, look, you have to be, people who are around me know that I always tell them, you got to be suited and booted. Right. Okay. Right. The world is going to treat you the way it sees you. That's right. Based on its perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't care much about your right to dress and look any way you please. <laughs> that's right. The world only cares to see you the way it wants to see you. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I won't even comment on, but that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so I always travel suited and booted because I know that how you look determines how people treat you. So when the cop pulls me over, I'm coming across the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. Mm -hmm. I go through the toll booth, cop pulls me over. How you at, how, how you refer to the cops? You know, we a lot of stuff we've seen, our young people have seen in the movies of how to deal with cops is bad. It's very bad. Very bad. Yeah. So yeah. When the cop pulled me over, I said, how you doing, officer? I said, did I do something wrong? He looked in the car, and I was suited and booted with my tie and everything. And he said, uh, well, you didn't have your headlights on. I'm like, get out of here. And I'm looking like, well, well how do you turn them on? You know, he said, he said you know, it's funny. When white people see a black man in a shirt and a tie and a suit and a tie, they want to think he's a minister. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> wow. I would be a minister. Think about it. When, a, when you see a white man in a suit and tie, you think he's a businessman. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an interesting paradigm? Man, those images. Boy. Yeah. So the cop looks at me and he says, he says, Reverend, you've been driving those luxury cars too long. In these, in these cars, you got to turn the lights on. And I'm like, get out of here, for real. I'm thinking, where do you turn the lights on? And they cracked up. They had a ball. Wow. I said, Reverend, wow. Hey, well, hey. <laughs> You think about it, when you go around with a suit and a tie, especially yep. a white shirt, Lord have mercy, put on a white shirt and a tie, <laughs> they're going to call you Reverend. Where's right. your shirt? You're a minister, right? I mean, all the time people come and talk. You're a minister, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm a minister. <laughs> 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 yeah, if part that makes of, you feel better. <laughs> that is that is so true because part, oh, I got to be, be so much to cover in that topic in and of itself. So part of the intricate components of my organization for Tease is having them, I, I share with them in some of my uh, my lectures and some of my, my webinars and seminars that try this, get a shirt, get a suit, shirt, tie, suit, shoes, and and uh, in their current attire, the sweats and the hoodies, go downtown, go to Midtown, just walk around Midtown and see how people look at you, right? Mm -hmm. See how they view you. I say the next day, put on a suit, shirt, tie, some shoes, go in that same area around the same time and see yeah. how the people look at you. You'll see a drastic difference of yeah. how people view you and you see how their attitude towards you change. So it's, it's yeah. very funny that you brought that up, Dr. Yeah. Harris, in regards to how your appearance plays a yeah. big role in how people respond. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Because if, if you don't take care of you know, your, your own self and your, 
presentation and how can other people respect if you if you don't seem like you respect yourself as far as you present mm -hmm. yourself but i will say this dr harris I, I i was one of those students who did have locks you know it's, it's, it's low pro now but but you know but i but the locks were for me were a cultural significance you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and but now unfortunately because how styles work and how like you said the miseducation when you mentioned yeah. earlier yeah. they get it for style not realizing that it's a cultural yeah. uh it's a cultural appropriation of their own culture yeah. Uh, not realizing the deep cultural significance that it does hold, the history it holds, and yeah. that's what it's saying about you and, and the stance you're taking. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like it, your dreams and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's very funny how in, here in the South, all the white men wear loafers, short pants, and a pink shirt. All of them look like Simon Cowell. That whatever that old gray T-shirt he wears. Uh, yeah. you, know, you walk around, it's like, did, did, did everybody get the same memo? Mm. <laughs> and so, it, everybody has their norms. Everybody has their 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 the way they want to look at things. But if we as black men have to operate as though we are in a war, and being in a war, you must always everything you do must be strategic. I agree. We are in a war. Never, always have been in this country. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And 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 Dr. Harris, let me let me ask you this. Um, like say saying we're in a war and 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 giving us these jewels of information, which we appreciate. Um, what can what what are some of the things that um, a person or family could do? in reference of success because like I said your book you know going into your book 12 universal laws of success first of all what led you to write the book and how had how has you how did you writing the book even affect you because people are like oh well you wrote the book and everything but you know we also know there's a process in writing the book and putting yeah that in yeah one of the things that i have always found is to follow your dreams and listen to the inner verse you know very early in life i got into meditation mm. very early i you know as a when you when you face with challenges and the more you're exposed to coming up in columbia as a black man i, I wanted to see everything i came out of columbia with a little bit of money and i wanted to see everything and i watched what the white kids were doing they were you're talking about the air when the beatles were going to india and the, Rabbi Shankar and meditation and all that. Well, I, I, I became a practitioner and I started getting into meditation and creating a daily rhythm for myself. Wow. And uh, one morning I was sitting, I, I, I began studying personal development and reading and take, I, I went to some of those classes, you know, and I was living on 144th right off convent, 423 West 123rd, West 143rd, West 144th Street, right off convent. Okay. And in my meditation, it said, I wanted to teach. I learned, you know how sometimes you, you learn a little bit and all of a sudden you become, you become enamored with yourself and you're like, I want to share this knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to run out and teach. I go out jogging that morning. I'm going through Central to uh, City College, and I run into Dr. Maddie Cook, who was one of the, the first president of Malcolm King College, mm. which was located in the Hotel Teresa at that time. Mm. I ran up to Dr. Cook. I said, Dr. Cook, I'd like to teach a course. She said, what kind of course, Mr. Harris? I said, a course on success. She said, what's the course called? And I pulled this title out of the air. It's called Achievement Motivation. She said, that sounds great. Why don't you stop by the office this afternoon? So sure enough, my office was in the building. That's how I knew who she was. Gotcha. I go now. She loves it. She said, can you start on Monday? Wow. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so in putting that class together, you know, all the books that I had been reading, Think and Grow Rich, you know, mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. thinking, they did not fit the mold for people coming to college. And most of the students at Malcolm King 
the folks who've already been out into the world and were coming back to try to get a, a, a degree. Okay. Okay. And so they were people, they weren't your normal students who were, you know, committed to learning about all the, you know, esoteric things. They just wanted to get a degree and, you know, to move on and do better. Mm -hmm. And so those books didn't really fit the mold. And so I started making notes. I developed a series of notes to teach from. So okay. the law of thought, you know, the law of change. And based on those notes now, that was the first evolution of the idea for a book. Mm. So to our listeners, make notes. You know, the mind, you forget it, it's gone. But if you write it down, I recommend that you carry. A, I always have notebooks. Just we're sitting here right now. I got a notebook. Yes, sir. And so you you write it down. So those ideas in that initial class that were like study notes mm -hmm. evolved into a newspaper column series. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the series was published. I had syndicated among the black newspapers all around the country. And I, I give a life lesson. Mm -hmm. The papers would not pay me. I was only charging ten dollars a week for the column. Mm. At that time, there were around three hundred black newspapers, and so I figured, man, ten dollars a week, three hundred newspapers, mm. wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good job. But they wouldn't pay me. <laughs> so you know, some would, but but it wasn't enough. And so at one point, I said, you know what, I'm gonna quit. Mm. I'm not gonna, you know, because. I'm not going to go to, to Arizona to get $40. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cash flow 101. That's it. So the day I decided that this is my last article, I'm not sending any more articles. In those days, you have to fax it out. Okay. okay. I'm not faxing nobody anything. That's it. I go to the post office over 125th Street. I had a P.O. box, and in the P.O. box was a letter. You know, small envelopes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. And the lady had written a letter, and in the letter it said that she was an elderly lady and she felt very depressed and she was going to end her life. And she had these old newspapers around. She mm -hmm. was going to wrap up the plates because she didn't want to leave the house junky. Mm -hmm. And then wrapping up the plate, she read this article called How to Overcome Worry. And after she read that article, it changed her whole perspective. And in the letter, encloses a check for $500. Wow. wow. So the lesson was, if you're on point yeah. toward what you believe in, yeah. the blessing may not come from where you think it's coming. Right. Mm, right. See? That's right. the essence of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence and of things, things not, not seen. seen. Very good. And so you keep moving. If I had not done that, and then when that lady sent me that check, that taught me, I said, you know what? I'm not looking to these newspapers for my money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I'm sir. writing these columns for me and for people who need it. And if I do my part, What's in my power is the power to write it and fax it. Now, they may or may not print it, but I did my part. You do your part, the universe will take care of you. Mm, that's ministry right there. That's, 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 that's ministry. metaphysics. That's ministry. That's metaphysics. That's creation. That, that you know, that's, you know, that's a spiritual experience. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Wow. How do I, how do I? How do we speak on that? <laughs> Where do we go from there? I mean, that, yeah, man, I you. <laughs> you well, know? see, you follow those notes. So those articles evolved into the first book was a book called The Laws of Success, which is a small pamphlet, about 45 pages. Okay. okay. And so you keep the idea in your head. You keep doing your college. You keep... So you write every, I do a class every Saturday morning at eight o'clock. I do what's called a success mentorship class. I do it on Facebook I read that, yeah. and I do a Zoom. Mm -hmm. And at one point my, my, my old lady said, she said, well, why do you keep doing it? She says, uh, you know, 
people watch it, but they don't send you any money. I'm like, I didn't ask for any money. She said, well, who are you doing it for? I'm doing it for me. Because it keeps me sharp. It keeps me thinking. It keeps me creating. Mm. And each one of these becomes a chapter in the next book. <laughs> Very good. So having that daily routine, that weekly routine forces me, you know, as a writer, when we talk about writing a book, most people don't finish the book because they don't have the discipline to do it. Right. That's why everybody wants to write a book. Everybody, yeah. everybody say, I should write a book about my life. Yeah, you should. Yeah. But most people don't have the discipline to sit down and do it. So by committing to this Friday morning, I have done 300 lectures. Very good. By committing to that, the book is is written now. Transcribe it, massage it. Very good. I can turn out a book every three months if necessary. <laughs> good job. Mm -hmm. So doesn't matter whether they watch it on. You know, I like people to watch it because I find that the people who watch it feel like they've been healed. Yeah. When they go to on Instagram, Dr. Success Man. Okay. People people plug in on Saturday mornings and I look at some of the comments, people get healed. Okay. Okay. Or they go to uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook, um, same thing, uh, DR Success Man, Facebook.com, DR Success Man. They yeah. watch at 8 o'clock in the morning and I get yeah. <laughs> Indeed, on Instagram, I catch some of it when I, when yeah. I get up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're great. So, just follow your dreams. And so that evolved from there when I finally, and in life you get plateaus. You see, life is like a stair step. You have a challenge, you meet the challenge, you grow, you go up to the next step. Mm -hmm. Then you get on that step, everything is going good. You seem like you've made it and it's fine, but then things happen, another challenge, mm -hmm. you grow to the next step. Mm -hmm. And so, that whole idea of following, letting your challenges move you on. Mm -hmm. When you get to a point where you get a great reward. So it came a point where uh, when I retired from my law practice, I was working with Tony Brown. Remember Tony yep. Brown? Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Tony Brown. Yes. And I went out to Cleveland. And in those days, you had Black Expo. Yeah, the Black Expo. Man. Uh, yeah, uh, Jerry Roebuck and the guy. So when I went out to Cleveland with Tony and he had a movie, he had produced a movie, I think called The White Girl. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Tony Brown's produced the film. It's about drugs. Okay. Yeah. Wow. The oh, the, oh, the slang for white girl, white boy, heroin. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, okay. it was called The White Girl. Okay. Yeah, Tony Brown produced that film. So I went out there with him. And I got to Cleveland, and I just felt something great about the town. I met some nice people. And so when uh, my ex, ex-wife ex and I, we were getting a divorce. We didn't have any kids. She was a model. We, so we split the money. We sold the house, at the one on 127th Street. We sold the house. Mm -hmm. And I took the money. See, now, when you get money, don't run out and buy stuff. <laughs> Invest it. Invest it. Use that money. That's the entrepreneur matrix. Yes, Take sir. that money, get out of New York, go to Cleveland, because you can live in Cleveland for twenty percent of what you can live in in New York. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes sir. <laughs> all south, all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Lost. Shout out to my crazy people, people family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, with it, if you, you got to have the dream, though, it, back to you got to have a vision. Yes. And for yeah. our young people. We have to help them develop a vision because without that, nothing else happens. Yeah. To that point, Dr. Harris, I want to share with you one of the uh, integral component, basic, fundamental parts that I teach the young people is five: the importance of a five and ten year plan to mm -hmm. map that joint out in five and ten years and how it includes that. So to that point, I, I just want to emphasize that vision yeah. plan. Very important. That's it. That's it. You see that? that that's the whole process. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go back scripturally, you go back to the Habakkuk. And Habakkuk says, write the vision, make it plain upon tablet. Mm -hmm. Can't be no clearer than that. It's one of the shortest books of the Bible, but it's so clear. Right. And it goes on to say, write the vision, plain upon tablets, that he may run that readeth it. Mm. That's a plan. 
Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it says, mm -hmm. though it may tarry, mm -hmm. wait for wait it. For it. Yeah, brother. <laughs> okay. Because your dream has a season. The Bible also says to everything is a season. Your dream has a season of its own. Mm -hmm. With our young people, one of the ways you undermine the, the, the dream is to create a dream that's not congruent with the season of the thing that they're seeking. Mm -hmm. So it's like a farmer. If a farmer wants to have corn, he said, look, my family's got to eat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to plant this corn. Mm -hmm. My family's got to eat next week. That can't happen. Right. See, because the, the, the season for the corn is 60 days to 90 days. Not true. Not true. <coughs> I don't know. Something that I had to. You good? You good? Yeah. Don't worry about it. You good? Yeah. I need to get some water though. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hydration is key, but no, you yeah. good. Yeah. So, so in turn, because uh, we're at the top of the hour. Yes. Right. So, um, I want to make sure if we have your permission to extend and go at least fifteen minutes uh, further, because I do. We do have some at least a few more questions we want to ask. If that's okay with you. All right. Well, let's do that. And I'll try to. I'll try to give Shaw the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'm the same way. We both yeah. together, man. Hey, guys, we got a lot to share. It, it just comes out like that. Hey, so, you know, we, we appreciate it. Trust. And I'm sure, I know the family appreciates it, too. Absolutely. So we talked about books. We talked about challenges. We talked about education. One of the things that I also speak to the young people about uh, is in terms of what is success to them. Right, mm -hmm. because some of the teens, success to them could be being a basketball player. We know the conventional basketball player. Yeah. Some of the success to them means being a famous rap artist or entertainer. We know that. Um, so I don't ever want to assume what success should be if it's not within their scope. Um, yeah. So in line with that, I would like to ask you, what is success to you? And why is it important for us to know how to attain it? And how do we define it for ourselves? That term success, which is ever so elusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Brother Bentley, the first, Success is a, it's not a destination. It's a process. Mm, gotcha. So success is a continuous realization of your worthwhile purpose. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so success is a lot like climbing a mountain. You know, you can be in the forest. And many times people will be in the forest of their reality. Their trees, their bushes, their poison ivy, all kind of stuff. It's like living in, in the jungle. But then there's a mountain there. And so when you climb the mountain, you rise above the forest and you can see more. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So success is that process of climbing the mountain because the more you see, the more you can be. Right. There is no end to it. If you can see it, you can be it. If you can see it, you can be it. Yes. And so when you can stop focusing on your reality, the current situation, your circumstances, and focus on your potential. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And so it's all about exposure. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I move a young person up the mountain, the more they can see, like I said, when they see a Ken Chenault, they're like, I didn't know there was a black man making $40 million a year exactly. who didn't have a jump shot. Exactly. <laughs> and maybe he does, but just not get a <laughs> Okay. He right. doesn't know how to rap. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, he he right. got yeah. no rap, man. He, his rap is rough. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So that as you go up that mountain of success, the more you see, the more you can be. But each mountain, you know, when you climb a mountain, you do it in stages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you get you get three kinds of people. You get people who are happy in the forest. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who like, you know, they're gonna cling to whatever it is. They'll cling to a job. Right. They'll cling to a definition that somebody else has given them. Right. And then you have people who want to climb that mountain. So success is climbing that mountain. And each time you go more, there's always more to see. There's okay. always more to be. But as you climb that mountain, your purpose is revealed to you at a higher and higher level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to start with a complete, absolute faith that God put you here to do great things. I'm glad you, you said that. I'm sorry, go ahead, continue. continue Dr. No, go right ahead, yes. No, what I was going to say is some of the challenges that I have with young people is um, having them, it's where to start. They don't know where to start. Right. Uh, because most but we have most people because their environment, they're so consumed by the environment, it, it, it's a foreign concept to them. Yeah. So the thing that I'm working on with, with, with my organization in the stages is I'm actually drawing up lesson plans as well, uh, just as syllabuses, is to start with helping them open their eyes and realize what is your inherent skill set. Yeah. What you do naturally outside of the conventional basketball and the rap music that's been programmed yeah. from the music videos that you see and the TV that you see. Right. Outside yeah. That, yeah, outside of that, what you do naturally, do you read naturally? Do you have a, a knack for wanting to know history? Do you have mm -hmm. a knack for counting? You know, these little things that can be translated into an actual career outside of that typical sport. And even yeah. sports in and of itself could be a venue for them because there's also sports, uh, what do you, sport accountants. Yeah, accountants, yeah. Sports, yeah. accountants yeah. and celebrities, you know what I mean? So just helping them expand that is some of the things that I share with these young people to help get them on that road to climbing that mountain to your point. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so important because without the exposure, they don't know it's there. No, exactly. You see, if you don't see it, you, if nobody's told you about it, you don't even know it exists. Exactly, yeah. And so as your young men, as young men who are charged now with really moving the moving the needle, really moving the, the overall consciousness, because it's, Really, it's the collective consciousness that really makes the difference. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can say, as they say, you can save one, and it's very important for that one that he be saved, that she be saved. But on a massive scale, you have to save more. Because when you can save more, then they can save more. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So look at that continuous growth to recognize that there's always a next step to success. There's always another level. And as you pursue, the Bible says, seek and you shall find. If you stop seeking, you ain't going to find nothing. Right. <laughs> You're going to think everything is fine. And then one day you look around and like, what happened? Right. So keep seeking and keep moving. Keep going and growing. That's success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Harris, let me ask you this. Like you said, you know, the, the giving and growing the exposure you know, I totally agree with, um, you know, it's not a lack of uh, ability to be educated and to learn. Our people lack exposure. Yeah. You know? um, and I want to piggyback on that because with your book, you know, it's a great read. You know, um, you know, it's 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 a book I found uh, a few years ago and then I discovered you because we met at an event and, you know, you have the 12 laws, you yeah. know, and I and what my and my question is, what I guess, what are the top three, you know, laws that you feel have, you know, enhance your life out yeah. of the out of, out of twelve laws? And what yeah. and what do you, I guess if you could pick one out of the twelve, I guess what would what would you what would it be for someone who doesn't know where to start to focus on first? Well, I lay the laws down. That's a great question. The the first law of success is the most important. And that's the law of thought. thought yeah. you know? It says, as a, the, the scripture says, as a man, I like to make it universal, as a mind thinketh in its heart, so is it, so is he, so is she. And so that is the most profound because everything begins in thought. Thought is like a seed. Every garden starts with a seed. Mm -hmm. okay? The seeds that we plant are the positive thoughts. But if you notice in a garden, nobody has to plant weeds. <laughs> nobody goes down and says, let me plant <laughs> today. So there's a universal negativity that exists. Weeds represent the yang, that portion, that negative, that night, that darkness. And so if you do nothing, the weeds will grow. Mm -hmm. And so the law of thought is your way to push back on the weeds. Mm. That is the primary one that, and because when you control your thinking, your thinking then controls everything else. Mm -hmm. Your thinking controls your emotions. So, you know, as a young man, for the first 35 years of my life, I was completely dedicated to chasing women. 
<laughs> I was clear about that. Hey, hey they'll do that to you. <laughs> and I, I was, as they say, committed. <laughs> and everything revolved around that. You know, at a very early age, I found that if you if you're successful and you have some money and some power, you get more women. Right. Yeah. So that was my frame of reference. You know, it was always about. I want to make more money so I can attract different women. I want to have a bigger car so I can ride bigger women. Hey. <laughs> okay. So, so, and that was all in my thinking. Because mm -hmm. that was my frame of reference. Yeah. So that's the most important thing. Your, through your thoughts, you can control your life. The second most important is the law of change. Because that said it. Be not conformed to this world. It says, whatever your condition is, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay stuck. If you're broke, you don't have to stay broke. Mm -hmm. If you're hurt, you don't have to stay hurt. If you're unhappy, you don't have to stay unhappy. So what you think is what you get. And you change your life by changing your thinking. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you can change your life by changing your thinking. Very so good. those two, <clears throat> those two are the foundation because the universe operates the basically four principles. There's the principle of energy. Okay. You see, yep. Einstein said E equals MC squared. Energy equals M and M is mass manifestation times the speed of light squared. So there's a direct correlation between energy, the level of vibration that you have, mm -hmm. and the manifestations you have in your life. Yeah. So in your energy level, when you deeply desire something like Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry desired to be a success in writing his plays and producing them. And he was willing to sleep in his car to make his plays work, to devote all of his money. You know? Or you look at Hugh Hefner with Play, Playboy magazine. He wanted to be a publisher magazine. He thought he had a niche and he committed everything to it. He said, I'm going to give up my apartment. I'll sleep in my office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I don't need a kitchen. I'll go out to restaurants and tell them I'm going to give them a good review. <laughs> okay. All women want to eat. So let me take some pretty women and take them to a free dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Creative. And so, when you when you recognize that that be, when you change your thinking you can change your life and then the third most important law is the law of vision mm. yeah. it says where there is no vision the people perish yeah. where you have no vision and that's the problem with so many of our young people we got to help them get a bigger vision yeah than basketballs and footballs yeah and yeah rocks and rock and rhyme and that those these first three laws are really the foundation on which everything else is based. So you can think it mm -hmm. to create your life. You can change your thoughts to change your life. And then you have a vision of what you want your life to be like. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Right on. And I never mm -hmm. noticed the uh, I know you know you hear all the time E equals MC square. But the way you put it in terms, of Dr. Herbert, was very good, very realistic. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because thoughts are things. Thoughts is energy. You know, yeah. Thoughts are things, and for every every thought, there's a vibration. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of research now that when you think in your mind, it emits certain wave patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when their desire is deep, Napoleon Hill said, "Nothing can withstand the power of a made-up mind." And so a made up mind is just a mind that's committed to a thought. Okay. And willing to make that thought transform the world to conform to the vision of that thought realized. That that that's deep right there. It's gonna take uh, myself and some of our listeners to really process that, Dr. Herbert. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um uh can I interject a question here, Carol? You have a follow-up. All right, so uh, Dr. Herbert, uh, we have another question for you. In today, and this is part of the, um, I guess we're going to segue into the personal because we're, you know, we're closing, got to close out, you know, the time is, is limited. So 
um this is going to be like that personal uh question i'm gonna interject to lighten mm -hmm. up everything first <laughs> so in this day and age we have a, a, a sort of epidemic in addition to the omicron and the, you know corona and that's the the divorce rate mm -hmm. right so <laughs> In your opinion, how does this work as far as relationships? Since many relationships don't even pass three years and the divorce rate is over 60%. So what is your take, you know, personally on that? Three, married three times, brother. I got an X, a double X, and a triple X. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> leave this thing. So, you know, what's your time? How does that work as relationships since many uh, relationships in the last few years and the divorce rate is over 60%? What, 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 what is your well, time? Where we at as a culture? Well, one, I think that relationships are key. Mm -hmm. And that so often we get people who are not clear about who they are mm -hmm. getting together with somebody else who's not clear about who they are. So most relationships at this stage consist of two people who don't know who they are separately trying to create something together. Well said, mm -hmm. brother. Right now. <laughs> you can't get any clearer than that, brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. And see, as you grow, as you grow, like many times in uh, relationships, one party grows faster than the other mm -hmm. definitely and so that then so you already got confusion in the in the in the initiation in the beginning mm -hmm. and then in the changes at the one part is transforming at a different rate than the other mm -hmm. which takes it even further out of whack mm -hmm. so now we were just insecure and now that you're making more money now mm -hmm. You're way more than you used to be. I'm really insecure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and so that then creates a whole nother thing. So when people come together, like I say, at this state where they are not clear about who they are, and then the, the growth of people's success being that continuous realization mm -hmm. of their worthwhile purpose, each person, your growth is on a independent plane in other words mm -hmm. your growth is personal right one of the big challenges of relationships is when people grow differently and then you have expectations of the other personal person that are not reasonable right mm -hmm. yeah. right okay. mm -hmm. and so you have all these dynamics so i got unreasonable expectations and my expectations are based on who i think i am mm -hmm. So now I came up from no stop and don't and shut up. And now you're going out into the world doing things, man, I'm, I am upset. And then the more upset I am, the more you are upset because I'm upset. The exchange of energies. Exchange of energies. Yeah. And so it, to, to bring about resolution, it's, it's almost like you have practice marriages, you know, like the first right. one or two. You're so confused. It's like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Like right now, I probably I am a great husband. Okay, but I've had practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you superimpose kids on it. So yeah. The, yep. you, have, you have the 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 dynamic of misunderstanding, and then when you bring kids and kids are, kids are crystallization of the moment. Mm, yeah, yeah, children, yeah. Children. Yeah, they say children come to teach you. Actually, that's it. Parents, mm -hmm. yeah, they they come and so here you have now two people who are unclear, having have to have a common purpose now. To... Oh, oh man! Oh, oh goodness! What's all his internet? Oh, <laughs> he was kidding. Family, family, look, stay on family. He's coming back on. Trust. We're about to end it. You know, I think Kaide probably have about one more question. Probably Kaide. I was going to leave the last question. Well, I'm now nah, I'm going to leave that last question to you because we talked about the laws of success. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, ooh, Dr. Harris. He, oh, here he is, family. Okay. Here he is. How about, like, I'll, all right, let him finish that and then we're going yeah, to. Yeah. 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 Okay, Dr. Harris. Okay. They try to cut the wisdom, but we back. We back. <laughs>
continue. Yeah, continue. Yeah. So you were saying with, with children. Yeah. <laughs> See, because children now are independent beings and they are sopping up everything that we are. Children are absorbing our vibrations. And so now, hopefully, this many times people say, maybe a child can help us stabilize the marriage. Right. That rarely happens yeah. because you got two confused people not trying to agree on something. Exactly. And it's feeding off your energy. You're the parent. Yeah. And meanwhile, the kids are, are, are getting these confused vibrations and they are internalizing and see that at least as people as adults we have the ability to discriminate between truth and falseness mm -hmm. as a child you accept everything is true mm -hmm. you have not yet developed the ability to reason and to make decisions mm -hmm. and so when when like with a child love is spelled t-i-m-e is that oof, oof. Oof. I said that in the previous podcast episode. Yes. T-I-M-E. T-I-M-E. Yes, indeed. And so when you get back and you talk to children, like when you progress along, you talk to a child at 22, and you wonder why they're all out of shape, out of whack. And they'll bring you back to the point when they were six and seven, and you didn't give them the time. Mm -hmm. You were saying you thought that love was spelled M O N E Y. Mm. So you're out busting it to make the money to give them a comfortable home, to make the money to so that your your wife can can be more devoted to raising the kids. You're out doing that, but the kid doesn't see it like that. All they see is you're not there. Yeah, they don't have a under they don't have the facility to comprehend why you're not there. It's interesting, you know, I've had, you know, children at different levels and when they get to be parents, I've had children come back and say, you know what, I, I understand now <laughs> what you were doing. <laughs> I understand when you weren't there, it wasn't because you didn't love me, but as a child, from my perspective, I interpreted your absence as lack of love. Yeah. Now that I'm a parent and I see what it takes to put food on that table, I know that I'd rather have you be feel lack of love than to be hungry. Lack of food. <laughs> lack of food. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, all of those things complicate the relationships. And unless people can really grow past it, it's really a, a growth thing that mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. when you can, like sometimes you like co parenting, you know, that's people do it, but. It, you know, the kids don't understand all the dynamics of it. Even even they grow it up, you know, like they still have a, a mindset of like inexperience. Uh, mm -hmm. They're still concerned with whether you like me, whether you love me as a parent and how you show that love. And if you show that love in a way that I don't understand as a child, I don't care about the money as a child. I, right. I want the presence. I want you to hug me and pick me up. Yeah. I was, they had a story of kids who were raised like they were triplets or something, raised by different families. And one of the families, the child was in a family that they didn't believe in hugging. And they had this philosophy, when a child starts crying, don't cater to him. That, right. that makes the child weak. Let him cry it out. I think I saw that. Go ahead. Yeah. And when you see that, then, then that grows up to, to be a person who doesn't love, who doesn't know how to touch. You know, mm -hmm. who's aloof. And so mm -hmm. when, when they see your suffering, they have the mindset it's like let you suffer, you'll get through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, hang in there mm -hmm. to your suffering. They said so, they uh, said Dr. Herbert, they said that that that's that seriously impacts and hinders it has a it has a drastic negative impact on the development of that child. Yes. Yeah. The lack of just the lack of touch, how touch, and they even did studies in reference to human hu humanity, how the, mm -hmm. the importance of touch is so important to humanity. When the pandemic took place, they were mm -hmm. talking about how not, you know, the six feet distancing and stuff like that, not right, right, part right. of our makeup is interacting with others. Yeah. So that not touching and not hugging a mother, not hugging the child, 
drastically uh, uh, affects the, the development uh, of that child to a dysfunctional yeah. state. Yeah. They said a child will actually, to add on, Brother Cody, thank you for sharing it, uh, to add on to what uh, Brother Cody said, they said that, you know, if a baby is not touched, it dies. Yeah. If you say, if you yeah. don't, yeah, there's a study, which makes sense, say, if you don't touch a baby, it dies. Yeah. It will die. Well, it's again, it's that interaction, that energy. Yeah. When you touch, your heart rate changes. Mm. Your thought rate changes. Everything, your your vibrations change. And so when you don't have that there, and then when it becomes the norm, you see, there's that there's that time between an incident where it becomes a habit, where it becomes the norm. And when the norm is not touching, you know, when you look at some of the European countries, like the Russians, they seem to have a that 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 humanity that warmth seems not to be there yeah rigidity. yeah and so you you say man then you can see when you don't have that warmth that humanity that connection then you can do anything to anybody mm-hmm. killing somebody shooting somebody has no impact on you because those centers become dead inside you mm-hmm. And you know, an emotion is like anything else. It's like a muscle. If that emotion is not learned and cultivated, it's lost. Right. Forever. Forever. So. Got you. Uh, Cal, I'm gonna add one more question. We're closing down. Yes, Cal. Uh, what? 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 Um, uh, 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 I know. I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. We're gonna do it. Uh, as we close this out, Cal, uh, like the personal question: What three words best describe you, and why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> going and growing, going and growing, and going the and reason growing. is that I look at my life. The reason, like my friends say, Herbie, you don't age. Now, well, I don't. Okay. I'm going to live to be 160 years old. Okay. I'll be 160 in 2104. That's right. Okay. Yes. And so anybody who doesn't believe me, stick around and see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And going and growing is, I always want to learn new things. I always want to see something different. I always want to go to the next level. Mm-hmm. And I'm committed to doing that, to learning, to to creating. Um, I'm writing books now. I've got two or three books in the hopper. I've got some fiction books. And so going and growing is my mantra, that as long as I'm breathing, I'm going and I'm growing. Thank you so much, Dr. Herbert. Look at this guy. Yeah, Um, yeah. So, I would say mine is patience because I'm gonna leave the last to you, Cal. That and then the last question for you to close us out. Okay. So mine is patience, right? I think I'm a very patient person. I've been told I'm patient because I do unto others I want done unto myself. The other one is calm. I, I, I'm trying to be calm, uh, which is in this world today. If you if you're not calm, it'll drive you crazy and to some extent kill you. That's why meditation is important. And then resilience. Again, to Dr. Herbert's uh, point. Uh, persistence and resilience your dream a dream deferred or you know being patient in what your calling is your prayer has its own appointed time so if you mm. give up you'll never get there. there's this little cartoon image that we've seen where a man is underground digging and you know he he stops right before he gets to that diamond right yeah. the whole thing so if, yeah. if you're not resilient and not persistent you can miss out on what you've been working so hard for for all the time so those are the three words that describe me cal i leave it over to you oh man y'all damn, y'all put me on the spot man three words dang um i'll say right now the ones i can think of now will probably be peace power and culture i mean okay. right now this might, that might change tomorrow but the peace for me because you know you have peace of mind nothing could put a price on that and it's an inner knowing, it's an inner uh, calmness, like you say, a calmness and just resolute of who you are, power, because it is a power dynamic and I wanna have the power to define my destiny, define my plan, define my world, my community uh, as, a, as a human being in the society and culture, because culture is where I come from. You know, the, the, our African culture is what sets the groundwork for me to be able to function and have the value system that, and beliefs that I have. 
So those are the three right there. Yeah, Woo! Yeah. Out. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so the last question, Dr. Harris, uh, why would someone uh, buy your book? Uh, who is it for? And um, how can they contact you? Well, uh, number one, a person should buy the book if they're a seeker. In other words, many people have moved to a point in their lives. Some people are like way off track. You really need the book because mm -hmm. the book can be your recipe to get you back on track. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of us that are doing okay. We just need a few minor adjustments. Just that one or two thoughts. And so it's it, the book is written for anybody who wants to make tomorrow better than today. If you have hope, you have health, then you can create a vision for yourself that brings joy to you. So anyone who wants joy, who wants to have hope, who wants to grow, the book is for them. And why they should buy it is because we have so many gaps in our education. There are a lot of volumes out there, a lot of material that like we've covered, but they should buy this book because it's more like a recipe book. Now you can buy a book on the history of cake making and you won't be able to make a cake. But if you buy a recipe book that says put in eggs, put in butter, put in, you can make a cake. And so the 12 universal laws of success is like your recipe book for success. And that's why you need it. Everybody needs a recipe. We want to get a desired outcome. And this book shows you how. The book is available. <laughs> the book is available on Amazon. Well, <clears throat> Walmart, almost all of these uh, digital websites. Mm -hmm. and you might want to show the book. Show it, yeah, please show it. Show the books to the love. And many of the, uh, the Black Book Club, the uh, Key Bookstore, all the Black Bookstores have it, all the major bookstores have it. So it's that we call it the Yellow Book, the 12 Universal Laws of the yeah. <laughs> And our website is uh, www.herbertharris.com. Mm -hmm. Herbertharris.com. And uh, we have a special website we're doing. I just finished a home study course called New You for the New Year, which mm -hmm. gives you four lectures and it's a workbook and whatnot to help you set yourself up to create the new you in this new year. And so you can get information from that. Yes, HerbertHarris.com, that's our website, HerbertHarris.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new you for the new year, when you go to our website, just fill out this little form there to contact us. We'll get you information about that, about the new you for the new year. But you check out HerbertHarris.com. You have information there. Fill out the form so we can let you know about the release. It'll be released shortly. And this book gives you a recipe book plus exercises to change your life. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Woo! This has been a very enlightening uh engaging uh just overall just you know beautiful uh session today dr harris i mean we really appreciate you taking your time out to share your wisdom with us your experience i mean it's just oh you know it's just it's it's a wealth of just knowledge that we can really take and really use to enhance our lives and we appreciate you definitely well, I well, I appreciate you for what you're doing because it's you all, you young men, represent the Moses of our era. Mm -hmm. And see, you, it takes young men like you to move mm -hmm. the masses, move our people to the next level, to the promised land. And so, whatever I can do to help, to assist, to be a part of it, just let me know. Thank you so Thank much. You. Sir. Thank you so much. And that's the goal, Dr. Harris. You know, we you know we know that we can do better. We know we've done better, and uh, you know. We also, myself and Kade, you know, are in that process as well. But we want to definitely be our best so the next generation can be even better than us. Yes. That's the goal. All right. Well, keep up the good work, brother. Thank you so much, brother. Cal, close us out, man. Do the one, two, three. I'm leaving that up to you, man. Indeed, indeed, family. So thank you for sh uh, sharing your time with us, family. This has been another Grand Rods Collective podcast episode. So please subscribe, 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 share, 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 like, like, like. Uh, on our YouTube channel, Grand Rise Collective, Facebook, Grand Rise Collective, uh, Twitter, we're on LinkedIn. We have the Anchor, the Anchor FM, Grand Rise Collective. 
So please subscribe so you can get more of our righteous, beautiful, engaging uh, um, uh, uh, guests such as uh, Dr. Herbert Harris and others for, for a lot of uh, empowering, uh, engaging, and enlightening uh, convo and information. All right. So as we always do, on the count of three, we do our peace out. Uh, and much love, you all. And we got more episodes coming soon. So on the count of three, y'all, we're going to do a peace out, uh, to Dr. Harris. So one, two, three. Peace. peace. <laughs> <laughs>